talk. So the first thing I want to talk about, which I think folks here are pretty um, the idea that American culture is really built on technology and what that means for ourselves as technological beings. And then moving into digital security as a way for individuals to control access to technology and access to themselves. Shifting to usability, talking about ways of accessing and also releasing data, as well as preserving it. Talking about usability and security together, both in cooperation and opposition. And then talking about how a usable security tool could really build an empowered public and make us sort of a larger, more um, idealistic structure, how we can actually create an empowered public. And clearly then the conclusion of how usable security will save us all. So the first thing I'd really like to do is talk about this quote. I'm going to read it. It is, we've arranged a global civilization in which most crucial elements profoundly depend on science and technology. We've also arranged things so that almost no one understands science and technology. This is a prescription for disaster. We might get away with it for a while, but sooner or later, this combustible mixture of ignorance and power is going to blow up in our faces. A friend of mine sent this to me a few years ago, and I thought it just so eloquently captured these things that I was wrestling with in my own career, and things I was seeing reflected everywhere, that we were becoming a society where no one knew how things worked anymore. And this is true in many levels, but specifically in my field, that we have these technological tools that are fantastic, and no one knows how to use them, but also no one understands what they're doing. People are constantly shocked with the data that's been shared, and certainly in light of all the NSA leaks, I think no one can really say anymore that we're not being watched or harvested or gathered. So what do we do? So we have this whole security research field, which is fantastic. I'm going to go over quickly what the cryptography world is doing about this, what, what kind of threat models we've been developing um, to understand the models that have been used, talk about trying to limit that access. So first, if folks are familiar with this, confidentiality threat model. It's this idea that Alice and Bob are two individuals who want to communicate or entities. And that we have Sneaky Eve, who's the eavesdropper, who is trying to intercept. Tools that address the confidentiality threat ensure that Alice and Bob communicate in a way that is secret, and that Eve, even though she can intercept the ciphertext, can't understand what they're saying. Tools that address confidentiality are things like encryption. Likewise, you have a second model, which is authenticity. So this has to do with making sure things have their integrity. So effectively, when Alice sends Bob the message M, Bob can verify that it came from Alice and that it was not altered in transit. Likewise, if Bob receives a message M prime from Eve, it will not authenticate. And it will be marked as a forgery, stating that Bob will know that it is not from Alice or that it has been altered in transit. Tools that preserve authenticity are things like digital signatures. So we have these tools, we have these ways, and they're, they're very well done, in my opinion. Like the, the current state of photography is fairly advanced. So we have all these tools. We actually can navigate this technological world I was talking about. We actually can restrict access to data. We can understand who's sending what. So are we done? Is this the shortest talk ever? Sadly not. Um, I have a second quote here, which is that each individual is continually engaged in a personal adjustment process in which he balances the desire for privacy with the desire for disclosure and communication of himself to others. So we have all these security tools, and it turns out no one can use them. One of the earliest studies was in 1999. A group of researchers found 30 or so people on the street, like basically, and gave them instructions of how to use PGP, how to encrypt an email, in an hour. And not only could no one do it, people were outraged and angry and frustrated. And there's a whole paper about it called Why Johnny Can't Encrypt, <laughs> which is fantastic. Um, and amazing that it's been known for so long. So maybe the second comment here is, well, sure, that was 15 years ago. There was a study done more recently in the last two or three years by Laurie Faith Craner, who's a fantastic researcher at the Carnegie Mellon, specifically studying um, online behavioral-based advertising, which is, you know, all those ads that show up because of the websites you visited, et cetera. And there are tools like Ghostry, in terms of other ones folks are familiar with, that actually help people regulate what is tracked and what isn't and what advertising looks like. So sort of similar to the previous study, they gathered up a bunch of folks, let them pick out the tool they thought were interesting, and then asked them to describe what their preferences were for security. 
so what do you want tracked, what do you not want tracked? And people configured it and said, I have succeeded. I am no longer being tracked in these ways I don't want to be. And researchers sadly determined that was actually not the case. People had failed at setting, setting their preferences to actually moderate their, their tracking. So people even accessing these tools, even thinking that they've succeeded, are actually still failing. The usability of these systems is so low that people don't even understand that they're making errors. So lastly, we could also say, certainly, we can just educate the public. We just need a smarter public. This is the problem. And my last tale of woe is from a very smart man, Nina Berlari, who's a fantastic, brilliant researcher at UC Davis, who has taught cryptography for 20 years. He's been a fundamental writer. And in his own introductory text, he actually had a probability error in assessing the security of the system that was pointed out by a graduate student some 15 years into his teaching. And he ended up writing a paper about how mathematical reasoning is actually too complicated, that people are unable to verify their own security, which is the same thing that we're seeing in the public. So even trained computer scientists are struggling with this. And there has been backlash, God bless them, from mathematicians who just say, just learn it better, be smarter. And I appreciate that, but we have now limited the set of successful security users to mathematicians, which is a rather small set of society. So what do we do? How do we, how do we make sure people can use these things? And then to further complicate our picture, I'd love to pull on this, which is that people don't also want to be private beings. People want to broadcast. People want to post on Facebook. People want to talk about their breakfasts. So what do you do to make sure not only that people can keep things private, but that people are sharing? We're, we have a technological self, and we also want a technological community. That's partly what this conference is. I talked with um, a usability expert, Luke Robluski, who's famous and wonderful, and asked him, like, how do you think we should marry security and usability? And he said, security is a waste of time. I want to point my phone in a bottle of ketchup, run it through Amazon, and have it shipped to my house before I walk inside. You know, which is hilarious, but also hard is the fact that some people love this. Some people want to be tracked. Some people feel like it benefits them. So how do we make sure that they have the choices to interact with all this technology and be tracked if they think it's a good choice for them? So it becomes this much more complicated picture instead of just these privacy tools, we actually have people learning how to almost engage in this new, this new realm. So we talk about usability. How do people understand what their settings are? How do people understand what the options are? How do we create successful people? I'm gonna go over some definitions here. If this is too boring for folks, I'm not sure how comfortable people are with usability, feel free to pipe up, etc. But we're gonna define usability. A system is usable if it's broken into these things. It has to be learnable, it needs to be efficient, it needs to be memorable, effective, and satisfying. I'm actually gonna go through each of these terms to really get concrete about what that means. The ease in which a user is able to understand how to accomplish a task or goal marks a system's usability or learnability. This can include a series of executable steps, as well as understanding and recognizing system behavior. Efficiency. An efficient system is one in which time and effort expended to complete tasks are commensurate with the difficulty of the tasks. Once users have learned the design, this can be measured, how, measured in how quickly users can perform tasks, as well as how much strain it causes to complete Memorability. A system is memorable if the user can return to the system and quickly reestablish proficiency. This can be quantified both in terms of time to reestablish proficiency as well as time away from the system. Again, this is trying to pull any scientific measurements to this, this larger concept of what it means to be easily usable. It means partly is making these things quantifiable so we can have statistics and interpret a larger picture. Effectiveness. Effectiveness measures the degree to which users are able to accomplish a task. This can be measured by how many errors users make, how severe errors are, and how easily users recover from errors. Satisfaction. A satisfactory system is subjectively defined to be so. This is really getting into the qualitative things. This tries to harvest the idea of there's a larger scope simply besides the system itself. We have to take into account 
domain knowledge, like competitor practices, user expectations, design best practices, industry trends. It depends a lot on what other people in your, in your ballpark are doing. This comes up a lot in practice where at my, at my company, we will research other companies to see if there's really cutting edge you know, banking procedures and whatnot. And some industries are actually, the bar is very low. Where it's like, great, if your website loads properly and you can log in without 18 errors, you know, like a rock star. And some industries, it turns out there's been a lot of competition. E-commerce, for example, they're competing with things like Amazon that spend billions of dollars on testing and all kinds of optimization. So the measurement of these things can provide meaningful and actionable results. These are both quantitative and qualitative. Just discussing how to actually carry out these things in practice. So quantitative measurement can be done by some of these methods. Analytics data, Google Analytics or other tools, provide great information simply about how many page views there have been, how many visitors have come, things like that. Conversion rates. Conversion can be defined as something besides purchasing. It can also be sign-ups. It can be email submission, things like that. Social media performance is becoming larger and larger. People are really interested in how discussions are happening, social sharing, things like that. User testing with methods like, methods like task completion or eye tracking, things that really gather quantifiable data. And then also error rates, simply like how many times people fail at doing something, if people ever succeed at doing it. There also, if you ever want something amazing to see on YouTube, watching user testing videos, you can just watch people become completely irate trying to use some systems. They're amazing. Just so I know. That kind of shifts into qualitative data where you can see someone visibly getting frustrated. Um, user interviews with open-ended questions, observing a user interacting with the system, and investigating system reputation or social network recommendations. Even larger things like, like a reputation or sort of larger scope of what people understand the industry to be it can be very helpful to understand why something is succeeding or not succeeding, why people consider it usable, a company you even worked for. Their website's not bad, but it turns out people just think they're jerks, which makes them not want to use their website, which is a big problem, and it comes back to usability. If people are not actually uninvested in your company, but have to for some reason, they're probably going to rank it as a more frustrating experience. So there's also types of user testing, which is, could be a whole talk in and of But these are a quick breakdown of the things that I've done. So you can do user observation in a controlled environment. It's more like a lab setting. It has the benefits of having very few outside factors, but it has the drawback of not really understanding how people choose to operate, or whether outside factors would be a part of the system used normally, like mobile use, things like that. User observation in a natural environment. Screen sharing user observation, which can be a really great way to remote test. So you can have people in their environment actually just watch what they're doing on their screen and talk to them and have them narrate what they're doing or what they're looking for. That's something that I've done a lot. So it can be a great way to access people across the country. It can be a great way of fitting into people's complicated schedules you know, to coordinate physical location. Mechanical observation, such as video recording or eye tracking. Diary studies, how people just write down what their experiences are, and you also have the benefit of doing this over time if you so choose. User interviews, and then user surveys, which can be a really wide swath of information if you have thousands of stakeholders and want to all ask them, what do you wish was on this website? What do you wish this tool did? Things like that. Likewise, Something I run into professionally is that some people feel like user testing just can just go on forever. So there's always more people to talk to, and it never really culminates into anything. But these are concrete deliverables that we generate from user testing and interviews. So a research and findings report, which is a fairly academic rundown of what people said and didn't say in statistics. We also have user personas, which are an archetypal abstraction of demographic segments. Those can be really helpful in designing for understanding who you're designing for effectively and making sure task paths are really called out. Customer journey maps, which takes sort of the beginning to the end of how someone would interact with the system, which would include things like talking to their friends or going to work. And you have these great moments of understanding what the touch points are and what information they're looking for. These have been especially helpful for me on more complicated processes like 
signing up for health insurance or something that people tend to take a long time to do and don't just sit down and complete in one session. Taxonomies. So all this information will give us a really great insight into data hierarchy, like what people really need to access versus what people don't mind digging for or have a logical sequence. Sitemaps, which are an abstraction <coughs> of the entire system. And then wireframes, which are basically a low profile or low fidelity mock-up of what the website would look like. This can be a great way to save on development costs and folks don't use those. And it basically can harvest all the ideas that are currently existing on how to design the system and run them by the client. You can also do user testing with wireframes. We also use a program called AppSure, which has clickable wireframes, which can show people what the interaction will look like to get through sign up, to get through logging in, things like that. So you can really understand, like, oh, we actually don't have an easy way for people to log out, or oh, when this goes wrong, it's very confusing the page will jump on. I'm just gonna pause for more. Are there any questions? Everyone is so sweet. Okay. So we have these two tools. I sort of talked about them more independently. We have security, these wonderful authenticity and confidentiality things that are so burly and hard to access. And we have usability, which is about people and using things and understanding what people need. And how do you bring those things together? First and foremost, people believe you don't. The current state is just the idea that these things are inversely related. And all, the best you can do is to balance them. The best you can possibly do is try and not make the security people too angry and not make your users too angry and balance. A very quick search on the internet yielded this graph, which just shows two little things. <laughs> you do more of this and you get worse this. I think it's gonna kind of be a problematic paradigm and part of this talk is to really challenge that idea. But it is worth noting, these are, this is what people are said about, right? Security can compromise usability. These are some great examples. Password protection, pretty irritating. People authenticate all the time. A study I recently said that most government workers authenticate roughly 20 times a day. Just exhausting. Uh, system lockout from accidental behavior, really frustrating. Session timeouts. Desired resources being deemed unsafe or denied. Restricted access to information based on role, security, clearance, or time. And limited or no user tracking, which can be a problem here if you want a system to remember you, if you want a single sign-in, if you want a system to to serve you better based on information it should already know. And you'll have to forgive me, but I found a Dilbert comic. Yeah, and I thought it was really funny, so I shared it. So it says, more that, the prevention of information services. Security is more important than usability. In a perfect world, no one would be able to use anything. And then this poor Joe is <laughs> reading a message saying, to complete logging procedure, stare directly at the sun. And I thought this so perfectly captured not only that people feel like security compromises usability, but that security is carried out by mean, angry people who don't like other human beings, and that security procedures are actually useless, right? Staring at the sun, not only does that frustrating, it has no purpose to the system that it's protecting. And it's damaging, right? Staring at the sun hurts. Security is really frustrating. So this is what we're going up against, trying to implement security systems. They're so unusable that people kind of hate them. So that's rough. Likewise, the other side of this, usability can compromise security. So really easy to remember passwords. Those are great, not great for security. Accessing the system without time, location, or duration restrictions. And just the ability to share content freely. Those things are really prized by a lot of users and are frequently limited or denied by security protocols. So what if we considered security and usability to both be properties to create a successful system? What if instead we said bad usability compromises security and bad security compromises usability? And likewise, good usability supports security and good, secu good security supports usability. And what if we just evaluated good and bad as relative to user needs? So this is a more abstract concept, but an example that I think really makes it concrete is simply your bank. Right? So would you consider a successful bank one that had really terrible security? Probably not. You'd probably be pretty upset if your bank account was mysteriously unavailable or empty or, you know, anyone could just walk up and find out how much money you had in your savings account. So in this way, 
the security actually is supporting the usability, right? If you consider the bank as a usable system, the fact that it ensures your account information is private. It ensures that no one can remove money from your account. It ensures that actions retract each user to ensure legitimate users are acting intentionally. You can find out what happened when and why. I can call my bank and be like, what's this charge? Those are all security tools. And they actually make the bank effective. Likewise, really good usability is actually enhancing security. If you're given early notice when passwords need to be changed to avoid pass poor password choices, confidentiality parameters can be clear and easily understood to support adherence. When people understand, it's sort of a great step one to having people actually comply with them. Likewise, if error messages are clear and give good directions, people can recover faster and not make the same mistakes in the future. So what if we had a larger system like this and we're able to carry it out in other ways? What if we were able to understand that security and usability actually can complement one another, can actually ensure that we have successful systems? So there is actually a field called HCI security. I think it's fairly small, but they have this wonderful definition of a threat model. So this is different than the threat models I talked about earlier, right? This is not authenticity. It does not assume a fairly antagonistic third party. It's this really sweet idea, I think, of a legitimate user who has no intention of breaking the system, but whose mistakes may compromise the system. That is not how security is designed. And it's not even really how usability is designed. It's really this specialized intersection that I think is really valuable and also harvests this idea of usability and security benefiting the system. What if we evaluated our security systems with this? What if we evaluated even internal business, you know, not even huge encryption systems, but just things we do at work, things we do to protect our privacy? If we, as system designers, consider a well-intentioned user who's simply frustrated, I think we could design systems that people don't have to have a PhD in mathematics to use. With that said, there's also this interesting caveat, and part of the model that I proposed assumes that the security and the usability both benefit the user. And I think it's important to say that systems like this if a user has to interact with the security system and the security system is benefiting the employer, that's also going to end up with a lot of tension. And that is a different kind of a system. Something like your bank, you personally want your bank information to be private. If you are feeling antagonistic towards your employer, that is the third wall of that triangle, which is outside the purview of usability and security. So it's interesting to talk about when we're using systems that benefit us versus systems that don't directly. Certainly people want to keep their jobs, but again, that's another level of abstraction. So if we have these tools, if we build an empowered public, if people could use their tools, if people were considered well-meaning, sometimes mistake-producing agents, if we have these mutually supported, the public could fully engage and manage their digital presence. What if people understood how to use these security tools and preferences and settings to actually display or keep private their data. If they're able to manage a digital presence, it would allow users to retain control of their data. This could be empowering as well as consolidating. And individual power retaining, each person is an active agent in shaping society and preserving democracy. So we have this system. <coughs> Watching all this happen always reminds me of the, the Industrial Revolution where we had this massive consolidation of power. And watching this happen now, this consolidation of digital power, this is what I envision some kind of revolution will have to look like. It will have to look like people taking control of their own data instead of their own time. And if we can do it with these tools, we would actually create a more empowered public. So at this point, I have a group activity we could do, or we could have a Q&A, or we could talk amongst ourselves. <laughs> do we have a vote? Group activity? Sweet. Um, love it. OK. So in this debate, there are sort of three primary groups that are discussed. There's users, 
there's corporations and companies, and there's the governments. And there's a lot of banding back and forth over who's responsible for privacy rights. Who's responsible for developing these tools and managing them and being a watchdog. And I've heard compelling arguments from all of them. And the project now is to get into groups and discuss based on which group you think should be in charge. <laughs> so, we're going to have people who think that users should be in charge of advocating for their own data and their own privacy in this section. We are going to have people who think the government should be in charge of regulating users and businesses in this section. And we're going to have the section of people who think corporations should be in charge of regulating their own data and privacy of others. I really appreciate your participation. <laughs> I think it'll be really fun. It doesn't sound like it was actually useful for security reasons. Because if the bank security questions are that easily defined on Facebook, Exactly. In fact, probably lots of different ways to get regulations. And, uh, and that's yeah. the scary part. Is it more it would be interesting if users had a, uh, I mean, users don't have the tools to be able to use it at all. And you can't have any meaningful way. Yeah. And we have no sense of what, what, your, what, your, um, what you do in your privacy options. Um, you know, consequences are. It's not like Facebook gets your page and says, oh, by the way, with your privacy settings, we're showing the whole world this. And, um, uh, and, 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 and by the way, we're sharing that with everybody, and um, and they're using it for this. And so we have no real sense of that first part right now. Um, uh, so obviously, anybody could add to giving them that kind of information would be powerful enough. Government in a democracy is how. But how do you get individuals? I think the interesting thing is if you swap the word, should or can't. I feel like the only ones who can. Right. It's a fundamental. Yeah. yeah. If you go back to the past, it's like, who is the, who are yeah. the people, who are the uh, entities who are holding the resource that they want to protect? It's us. 
And so nobody, we're never going to be secure as long as there's some third party proxy that we're giving our resources to and saying, you protect it. Rush towards openness, right? The, 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 the data itself yeah, is the solution we're creating that we're going to regret in five or ten years, how much of it yeah, is the, 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 the cleanup is going to be kind of That's a really good point because I'm on the job search right now and I put a lot of stuff out there that I didn't want to just because I think it's going to exist my chance to find it. Right, right. You're going to have to compromise yourself. Well, yeah. Just to, just to make I wouldn't mind if somebody hacked my government needs to clean the other thing out. Because my Yahoo mail, I've had since the 90s, and when they took away the limit of how many emails, I didn't even pay attention to it. And it's like an old boss of dad's two kids. In this case, I'm very selfish about it. I just don't really have a mail account. The ones I really want to keep, I do in the folder. You'll preserve the privacy. You talked about the tools. Let's see if we can have our own. If our job is to advocate for users being in control of their data, and at the same time, the corporation is taking advantage of. You do sort of have to have an open question. Not necessarily always maliciously, but because Facebook is a tool for people to share things. I know Facebook. No, no, no. Facebook is a Facebook. You can call Facebook a tool, but you're you're the tool, right? Like I said, it's the only way I know what my family is doing. I understand. I understand. But you know, like I say, the product is the product is free. You're the product, and it is a tool they use. So. If they're giving this information to a third party and not mm -hmm. having control over what that third party does with it, the, the other side of that coin is don't give it to a third party, but give it to something to share, right? Or share directly. So you know, don't those that those tools are free. have to be figured out. Where do they come from? Who does sort of control the tools, right. reviews, things like that? Yeah, or are they, there's okay. definitely a big question of like, whether the user can even control their own security because it is actually not that easy. I mean, when you consider the number of websites that the default security question is still what's your mother's maiden name, right. I can go on Ancestry.com and find out my mother's name in five seconds. One right. determined user is not going to be able to Right. appreciably improve their own security in participation in so the whole webinar. Are you but together, we have to be able to say, well, the user can do yeah. it, too. So yeah. not that I think that the, the key, one of the keys is the emergence of protocols, which takes a lot of time and, you know, some trial and error to some extent. For so, like, I'm I'm really interested in this project that um, that has a, a collaboration model where people can sort of decentralize make modifications to the to an object and, but they do it by making signed claims gpg signed claims so this is like an infrastructure that if that became popular then that could really help with authenticity i mean that's uh that other side of the point of how users can actually control it which is basically users can control their security by saying well i'm not going to use this system because i don't trust it. right participating in networks that are maybe more open and maybe have better security guarantees and maybe the people who are operating it and developing it are very trusted yeah there's also some pressure for the hacker world, right? You imagine what you're talking about where it puts, or, or imagine what you're talking about took over, right? TCP, IP, like, all the way down the stack, operating systems, everything that's cryptographically signed and, you know, um, in a distributed way. Uh, that's also like infrastructure for DRM everywhere all the time. Exactly, exactly. Um, and, and so it's harder to hide in, so we're kind of talking, if, if all communication well, is uh, uh, authentic, Authenticable, so, uh, then if you're talking about the public and private, then you're and you right. so you don't authenticate it or something. Yeah, and then like, if you're um, say, well, like off the record, it's like, it's like, why are you doing that? What do you have to hide? And then, like, you get all becomes very transparent and to everyone. Like but you know, or if you're some kind of enforcement, like, okay, right, and that's that's a cultural discussion that we have to have about you know, and I. It seems to me that it's inevitable that there are information technology and there are things that we are going to have are radically different. Well, the trick is how do you make your Bitcoin wallet anonymous, right? Because once you have that part solved, then you know. Yeah.
obsession. Products that I was going to say, you know, we're talking about like, you know, personal obsession. When I was a kid, like, my yeah, it's, it's bank gave me like, a passport. Know, and I was in food, like, it's there great was to know no what you're eating. If I lost the thing, I lost what was in there. Like, I mean, there was really the no way to go back to the bank and say, this is me, I lost my passport. Yeah, sometimes it's different. Yeah, 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 it's different. Yeah
Yeah, we're the only ones with an interest in maintaining our privacy, so we need to be the, the beginning of that change. Yeah, because status quo is probably the first so time as long as they have the users. <laughs> Roomy. <laughs> I think the sense we should present it is not the government should be in charge of privacy, but the government should. It looks like there's only two of the responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to I just said, told them, I was like, I'm just going to be the corporation. No, I just know. Yeah, I said that we know what exactly we want to say. What is that? What I said? Yeah, I have to remember what I said. I like um, um, be the change. My talk is next, right upstairs. But it's speculative cryptography, sort of about the stuff we've been talking about. Cool. Hopefully, it's a corporation of government. Yeah, it's a corporation of government. Two up earlier, or two hats before. Is there really? That's an easy I was just confused because I thought it was already in the first floor, so I was like, do I have a regulation for I really want to go when I'm a session chair. It's in the car, you have to submit. Yeah, it's in the car, right? But I'm glad it was in this talk, so. Thank you. 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 Yours was already taken. So, all right, guys, I think we're going to come up and share. So you're going to be the speaker for your group, it sounds like. I guess so. I didn't check on these guys. All right. I need to be a timer. Do we have a speaker announced from that group? Do we have someone here who wants to give, to give the, the single statement of why government should be in charge of privacy rights? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Amazing. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll look at you the number of our group who is in diet and diet group. Amazing. What did you mean? Agnostic gives me to you. Take it. Okay. Do okay. you want to start? Sure. So for government, we were thinking um, Basically, the role would be in consumer protection, just like we have for like automobile safety or food has to have certain requirements. And um, there's a situation where uh, individuals aren't going to be able to help themselves necessarily. And so that's a role that the government could play to help provide this. Excellent. Thank you so much. So our, our statement is, as a user, the only person who actually knows exactly what they want to share and what they want to be private is the user. So really, no other organization, corporation, or government can really dictate what that is. The user has to. It's our interest, right? It, to, it, it, we're the only ones with the interest. And who will protect our interest? Yeah. Right. Excellent. And me, as a low member of the corporations group, will state that corporations are uninhibited by the government's very lengthy and really behind the times bureaucracy and also has much more money and resources than any individual user and is inherently invested in pleasing users and keeping customers. So therefore corporations are an excellent source, even though they're not a trusted party, kept in line by government by failures to do so by new data breaches, they can still be a fundamental Bastion of privacy rights. Stone the witch! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for participating.